like three movies this week because by some miracle we actually did get White Boy Rick. I honestly can't believe it. Um, uh, obviously I skipped over a simple fare for this week, but I will probably get to it soon enough uh, due to just hearing interesting things about it and being somewhat interested in it to begin with. But before we get to that, uh, let's go ahead and start with these three, uh, starting with The Predator. I remember when The Predator was announced and it, like, really shot up quickly on my most anticipated list because it had, like, you know, obviously Shane Black was doing it, and I'm, I'm not particularly insane for the Predator movies, but I like them well enough that a new one gets me excited, I guess, uh, completely taking Alien vs. Predator out of the equation, both of them. Um, and then this cast list, this insane cast list <laughs> came out and it was like i feel like there's no way this can fail it has to at least be decent or a guilty pleasure or something there there this cannot be a bad movie with all this going into it um and then slowly things started to seemingly fall apart a little bit um apparently people weren't crazy about the trailers they weren't crazy about the promotion I guess there was a lot of recutting, and then the, you know, very abrupt last-minute cut they had to make as well. Uh, and it just seemed like it was coming together as one big mess. But even so, I just kind of kept thinking, but still with that cast and just being a Predator movie, it's like, even if it's messy as hell, it's got to have something to it that's entertaining enough. Um, so that was my mindset going in. <laughs> So, um, and we're back, uh, in, I guess, civilization, I guess you could say. We seem to be going back and forth with the first movie being in the jungle, the second movie being in the city, Predators being in the jungle, and now we're back to the city. So, um, but actually we don't quite start there. We're back, we start up in space again, kind of like we did, uh, in the first movie when we saw the sort of crash land happen from a distance. Only this time we actually see, like, inside the ships, and we see them, like, piling it and all that. And it's like, once again, I, I hate to just kind of jump off, you know, the ship immediately, but it was like, when I first saw these and saw them walk around the ship and stuff like that, it was sort of like, this almost feels like we're looking at a sequel to Galaxy Quest <laughs> starting. Um, but it was like, you know, just forget it, we'll just give it the benefit of the doubt and keep going. Uh, wait for, at least wait for them to get to Earth before we start judging anything. So, just let it get that far. Um, so, obviously, we're going to run into um, all the scientists, like uh, the Sterling K. Brown character that's very mysterious kind of at the start, but is clearly in charge of something. He's the one that gets uh, the theme from the first movie plays when his helicopter comes in. Uh, he's that guy. <laughs> um, and we're introduced to characters like uh, Jake Busey, who is apparently supposed to be the son of the Gary Busey character from Predator 2, despite the fact that Jake Busey is pretty much pointless in this movie. Uh, it just appears very quickly, so that connection, I don't even think it's mentioned, it might be mentioned in his name, um, but uh, so many things leading into this apparently just kind of don't matter to begin with. Um, and then we have Olivia Munn who comes in continuing to be the mo one of the most uninteresting actresses working today. Uh, it's like that's it's like the one thing in the casting news where it was like, are you kidding me? We've got like Keegan Michael Key, we've got Trevante Rhodes, uh, Jacob Tremblay is an odd, you know, addition here, but okay. Uh, Sterling K. Brown obviously, and then it's like, oh yeah, Olivia Munn, and then it's like, oh, okay. But <laughs> um, still, in, in a movie like this, maybe that won't matter. If there's enough, you know, action and the action's done well enough, and obviously being Shane Black, you can expect something like that, usually. So, um, with maybe a bit of humor thrown in, because it is like, you know, Shane Black played the the dude in the first movie that had all the bad jokes, and it's like, it would make sense if he brought bad jokes to his own Predator movie. So he, so he has done that. Um, but even so... Uh, and obviously you have your ragtag theme with uh, all the people I mentioned. And Boyd Holbrook is basically our our star, like the leader here. Uh, and Thomas Jane, who has Tourette's apparently. Maybe not necessarily Tourette's Tourette's, but movie Tourette's for sure. Um, and while we're on the subject um, of how the movies portray stuff like that, um, we do have the Jacob Tremblay character who, you might obviously it's Shane Black's sort of like trademark to have that, you know, precocious kid character. Um, but here, it's like, how can this possibly fit in? Well, Boyd Holbrook apparently has um, some of the Predator armor 
uh, hidden away to where it's apparently easily accessible. The scene where it cuts to him, Jacob Tremblay finding it and going through it, is very, like, sudden. Like, I don't remember there being any build-up to it. So we're just supposed to assume it was probably pretty easy to obtain. So, um, he... Eventually, it basically turns into Mercury Rising at this point, where he's able to... Uh, by the way, um, we know that... I wasn't quite sure what direction they were going to go, because it's never quite sure how, um movies are going to identify these things, but it sort of kicked in the whole autism thing with, um, he covers his ears a lot, especially when there's loud noise, and it plays big, you know, whimsical music uh, as he arranges chess pieces. So that, that's, that's our big clue, despite the fact that the bullies in his school, because we really needed bully characters in this movie, and they're like really over-the-top bully characters, too. Their first scene is them being like, way too into pulling the fire alarm. Like, they look like fucking cartoon characters. They look like rejected bullies from Hey Arnold or something, and they, and they do that. Um, and they say, they call him names like Asperger, and then it's like, wait a minute, is it Asperger's? And then it's like, oh, I guess the bullies don't know, and that's the point. Um, and then they also say, what are you going to do? Wash your hands 500 times? And it's like, they're just, they're just totally lost now. <laughs> but it does, it, so my first thought was like, does the script not know what he has, or do just these bullies not know what he has? Either one is equally believable. But anyway, uh, he, gets, he puts on the um, Predator armor because it's like a Halloween costume, because it's Halloween. Um, so Shane Black has gone away from Christmas now. He is now into Halloween, apparently. Um, and he, he basically calls them. That's the extent of it. Remember in Guardians of the Galaxy when Drax just called Ronan and Ronan just spontaneously appeared? Uh, he basically does that. So, and that's basically what our plot is. And then our, you know, group of criminals or whatever here with their big-ass guns will fight, and that's that's the remainder of the movie. Uh, it's a bunch of guns firing and predators jumping from here to there, sometimes fighting each other. Um, regardless of what you can say about the movie, it is always kind of a cool concept of uh, a predator themselves getting the despining thing that you they usually are doing to human characters, so... Um, it's not without its moments, um, but those moments do feel few and far between when you're basically looking at this 90s monster movie. Not even 80s. Like, this movie doesn't even go back to the 80s where this started and try to make it feel like that. This feels like some low-tier 90s monster movie that would just come and go. Um, and there's really not much to it uh, apart from that. So... And then they do try to throw in stuff like, almost like, I don't know if meta is the right term, I, I guess I guess it would be. Um, they have stuff like um, how it's, co they're calling it a predator, by name, and so the whole thing now is they're debating if the, ter if the term predator by definition even fits this creature. And so they discuss that, and it feels, and this happens a lot, and they play it for comedy, and it basically feels like they lifted something like, a online forum discussion of Predator and just put it in the script and had these characters say it. Um, and it's... And yeah, it's as clumsy as it sounds when you do stuff like that. Um, and then you also have stuff, like I said, obvious, you know, cuts were made. Maybe, maybe there's a line that I missed, but to my understanding, it was the whole thing where there was that controversy that's, like, still happening right now where um, Olivia Munn found out that one of the co-stars, the guy that's shown up in a few of Shane Black's movies, was, is a sex offender and felt uncomfortable being in a scene with him, especially being a character that's supposedly, like, hitting on her constantly or something. Like, it's, it was supposed to be her character's intro or something. Whatever that was supposed to be. But, um, so obviously with him, the, the, that scene being cut out of the movie... Um, there's a line later where somebody calls her Sunshine, and she whips up a big-ass gun and says, I'm really tired of people calling me that. And it's like, uh, that sounds a lot like it was supposed to be in that scene <laughs> that was going to be her intro. And it's like, I guess that was her whole character arc, was she got hit on, and she continues to get hit on throughout the movie. So she's tired of it. She's going to show how badass she is. But, um, yeah, when you cut out that scene, um, even that, basic cliche story arc for your female character that's supposed to be this big badass um, is just not coming together because it's not all there, literally. So that's so that's weird. Um, and then you have um, st stuff that comes in later, like when... Um, like I was talking about Sterling K. Brown's basically the guy that comes in. He's wearing the 
I mean, it's not a lab coat, but he's wearing a white coat, so we, we know where he goes. Um, but the thing here is that he eventually becomes very antagonistic, and this seems... I mean, I guess maybe he's a, he's a little bit... He just seems to sort of have an arrogance about him in his first few scenes. But then when he's suddenly here with all the other characters, they want to make him a bad guy really damn fast. It's like Topher Grace and Predators all over again. Uh, as cool as I actually thought that twist was, it did feel like very last minute and like they didn't do anything with it. It's like it's a cool reveal, but then that's the extent of it is the reveal. Then <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere else. Um, and that's kind of what this feels like where he just seems so aggressive so suddenly, um, like I said, he, me, sure he was doing shady shit before, but I mean like the aggressiveness of the character just seems so abrupt in these last few minutes. Um, and it's stuff like that where it just feels like a lot of it is like really chopped down and it feels like there's stuff missing everywhere. More than the stuff we know is missing, stuff that it's hard to tell where it went. Um, or if the script was just this disjointed all along. Um, it's, after a while it's kind of hard to tell. Um, and then we eventually get to, like, a really rushed climax, um, to where, like, it's one of those cases where I wasn't even, I, when it got to the climax, I didn't even realize for a long time that we were at the climax. It just felt like another action scene, and then it was, like, as suddenly, you know, it gets bigger and bigger, and it's like, oh, this is the end, apparently. All right. Um, so, I suppose that's, um, you can chalk that up to decent pacing, that I didn't realize we were that close to the end already, but, uh... Still, it does feel very, uh, yeah, just not well put together. So, uh, the action itself, like I said, there's a lot of guns going off, a lot of Predators doing their thing, but, um, it's not particularly exciting or particularly inspired. Um, a lot of it's, you know, obviously we have all these dark scenes, so, which, which is sort of like, you know, the, sort of a death curse that a lot of action movies have, where they seem to just really you know, bask in just everything happening in the dark and very quickly and very choppily edited and all that. And after a while, you're not even sure. Because there's a lot of, like... We have, like, a huge band of characters. Alfie Allen is somebody I forgot to mention. Um, a lot of damn characters on this team. But it's like they were so in love with the actors that they didn't want to, like, do much harm to them too fast. So before anything major starts happening to the major cast until, like, the last ten minutes, um, it's all just sort of faceless dudes that work for Sterling K. Brown, just getting eaten or blown apart or whatever. And it just makes it... Because that's the thing where... I didn't want to turn this into a whole, oh, this is what the, the original did so well. Because even though there are, in fact, people out there who will tell you that the first Predator is a masterpiece, um, I don't think it's anything that particularly great. But um, when you look at what it's come to now you can look back on it and see like you can appreciate how like when all the character even though the first movie is one where the, all the characters are basically known for like one trait um still they were identifiable enough that you didn't need to do the whole everybody gets a backstory in like you know the van or the office or whatever um they were able to just they did had that one scene where they just showed you each character and even though they were identifiable by maybe one or two things Still, it, it didn't feel like they were just throwing information at you just so they could kill the characters anyway, because it didn't matter. Um, it, 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 that, that's something that you miss. Um, and then there's the whole thing where the only thing we focused on in the first movie was that group. Like, there was nobody else. There were, like, you know, some, there was, like, the whole, you know, the whole village scene, and then, you know, the, you know, higher reps back at the base or whatever, but once we're in the jungle, we pretty much stay there, and it's all, these are the only expendable ones, they're the only ones that can be killed, so the stakes are constantly up. Um, that's something you kind of miss in a movie like this, where it's like, uh, the team is going to be over here, and we'll just kill all these dudes that don't matter, that don't even have faces, practically. Um... So, yeah, but even so, um, that's, it, it's, it's not terrible. It does go in very dumb directions. Um, in regards to, like, the kid being connected to it, like, how exactly, like, why it's so significant, um, it's kind of bordering on the direction we went in Jurassic, the, in Fallen Kingdom, the Jurassic World sequel. Um, and it's, 
yeah, it's not a good idea, <laughs> but, you know, there's there are dumber things out there. There are much dumber things out there, but I'm sure people will throw a holy shit fit <laughs> for some of the directions this movie decides to go that just aren't very good ideas, but... It just overall, though, I didn't think... I mean, there is an appeal to the cast, even though some people are wasted. Like, Keegan-Michael Key um, is so much funnier than this character uh, by, by a long shot. Um, but, you know, overall, that's... It's, it's nothing too excruciating. It's actually kind of what I expected, just a little more competently. I wish it had been more competently put together. Um, that would have saved a lot. Um, but yeah, it doesn't even, it doesn't even really feel like a Shane Black movie. Even Iron Man 3 felt a little bit like a Shane Black movie, but, uh, this, it feels very distanced from that. So, uh, that's, that's what we have here. But I'm not like, you know, I don't think it's like absolutely dreadful or anything, but I'm sure plenty of people will tell you that. So, uh, that's what they think and this is what I think. So there that is. Um, we're gonna go on to White Boy Rick, um, the movie that has a very interesting story behind it in regards to, uh, this kid who is, like, when it all starts, I think he's, like, around 15, um, and he, he and his dad basically run guns. It's, it's his dad's whole thing, but he's basically, he knows all about it, and he's, he's more or less there, sort of, as a helping hand, and as he gets more into it, uh, the farther into, like, criminal underworlds he gets into. And then eventually, uh, there are two detectives who are Rory Cochran and Jennifer Jason Lee who recruit him to be, uh, an informant, basically. So he goes into all these places, does all this shady stuff, and then eventually this, I mean, I guess you could say it's a spoiler, but it's, in any plot synopsis you read, everybody's talking about it, and it's a, obviously true stories can be found anywhere. Eventually, he was arrested and put in prison when he was 17, uh, and still isn't out yet, uh, <laughs> because of the really, uh, fucked up war on drug stuff that was happening in that era. So, the, and then, there's, it feels like there's so much to tell in this movie, and it just, it goes in so many directions, but it feels like none of the ones that are interesting, <laughs> um, because, well, for starters, we do get this sort of introduction, like, at the beginning of just the assorted cast of offbeat characters we have here, uh, where we have McConaughey's character. Obviously, it's McConaughey really going into this. He's got, like, the mullet and the mustache and all that, and he's sort of seems constantly on edge, especially with the business that he's in. And we've got um, a drug-addicted sister to um, Rick Jr. and obviously daughter to Rick Sr. who is uh, Belle Valley from Diary of a Teenage Girl. She's got a couple of subplots going on here and then next door are Rick Sr.'s parents, Bruce Durr and Piper Laura, who are basically watching all this stuff happen. And the introduction of the rest of these characters kind of all happens in the front yard and they're basically doing the dysfunctional trailer trash thing. It's like if you take the big ass rifle out of McConaughey's hand, this is any normal white trash family basically. Um, you got Bruce Dern parked in the middle of the street while he's trying to see what's going on and all that. Um, but it just feels like a giant mess. And there is, like, so much of this, there is hardly a grasp on any character whatsoever. It's more like it's trying to say, this is what the characters are in general. But when it comes to actually observing the characters and really going into that, um, it's just a lot of surface-level stuff. Uh, and we don't get that, we don't get very far into that, even at an hour and 50 minutes. And even mainly focusing on just, um, Rick and McConaughey. Um, the casting of Rick is also, uh, an interesting story in regards to, uh, what was his name, Richie Merritt, who was a guy that apparently when they cast him had no idea who Matthew McConaughey was, and they basically just went around, like, on the streets and in schools, and eventually when they described the character, um, a principal at the high school they were at, uh, immediately pointed this kid out and said, that's him. And then McConaughey was basically talking about how, like, insanely impressed he was that this kid they just plucked out of a school uh, was just, like, so natural on camera and just knew, like, exactly how to, almost like he knew exactly how movies were made. Uh, and he just went about it really naturally and was always, like, just right there with it. Um, which is really interesting and sort of bizarre to just be so naturally, like, 
be so natural in regards to making a movie despite never being in this environment to the point that you don't you, you don't know Matthew McConaughey when you see him for the first time. Um, so that in itself is impressive, but even so, even with that in mind, it does feel like there's... Like, at first you want to maybe jump on him because you think, oh, well, he'd never been in a movie before, and the characterization feels dull, so it must fall on the actor. But, I mean, when you look at the rest of the movie, um, it's just so... It just has such... An attention pro like its attention span is way is very very small um, so it's like it's not taking really the time to do much character work at all so I think that's where probably a lot of um, like if Rick doesn't come off as an interesting character to an audience I think that definitely falls on how the movie's written and how it's made in general and just how it just feels really unfocused for most of the time um, because we do have stuff and like uh, sometimes they'll even introduce characters that seem like they're crucial and they keep coming back up in dialogue and we're making judgments on them but we don't know them we don't like okay so like the Belle Pala character the sister um like the first time we see her she's making out with her boyfriend and McConaughey comes in with the rifle and says that guy's a piece of shit he needs to get out of my house and the dude drives off and eventually she goes and she stays with him and that's apparently where she gets all drugged out and gets her own subplot. She gets the Chris Rock and New Jack City subplot where it's like, what the hell movie am I watching again? And now it's suddenly a drug addict slash detox movie. Um, which happens very late in the movie when we definitely should be focusing on other stuff. But despite the fact that that is the only scene we see the boyfriend of him getting up off the couch and leaving the house, we never see him on screen again. But he's built up to be, like, this real piece-of-shit character and the one that's, like, hooking her on all these drugs and all that. We never see that dude again after the first scene of the movie. <laughs> and you can tell there's definitely something here to where the movie's not quite got a grasp on these things as much as it should in a lot of these characters. Um, there is a lot, like... I mean, sure, they're going for the 80s aesthetic. Like, uh, there's a lot of... People party, partying with blue lights. There's a couple of roller rink scenes. Um, and it seems like this kind of stuff was more of what the direction they seemed to want to focus on. Was just sort of like the aesthetic of this era as opposed to the characters in the movie and what it, the story, the true story that it's trying to tell. And really, these pieces just feel like they don't fit together at all. It feels like every other scene is like a brand new movie. And like one you've walked in on in the middle of. And it really, yeah, with it, with it, because this definitely, I keep saying this, but really, this should have been, a, if you don't want to focus on the characters as much as you should, this movie should at least have, like, some suspense to it. And, like, maybe if, obviously, being a true story, you want to stay as true to life as possible, and maybe it did feel relatively mundane despite some of the stuff here, but... Being a movie, you can take the freedom to maybe add in a fictional scene here or there. It gives the movie some suspense. I mean, when you hear the setup and the story, you sort of immediately think there's going to be maybe at least a couple of really intense scenes here. Like, think back to uh, the Brian Cranston movie, The Infiltrator, which was really nothing special at all. <laughs> but it had, like, one or two scenes in it that were so intense... I still remember them, even if I remember nothing else about the movie. And they perfectly fit in with that plot. It's the kind of stuff you'd expect from a story like that. Um, but this doesn't have, like, any suspense to it at all. Uh, the crime scenes in particular are just kind of deals happening or deals almost happening, and then he goes off with some girl or he goes to the roller rink or whatever. Then we get another side plot where he has a kid with this girl, just at random, um, and it's, yeah, it just seems like there's so many directions it wants to go, and there's so many things where it feels like it has to tell this part of the story, or it must tell this little part of the story, or else we'll be missing the true factor of it all, but it's like, in all, trying to get all these details, um, you kind of forgot the center, like, it's all, it's all around here, but there's nothing at its core at all whatsoever, um, and it's sort of like one of those things where you just kind of keep waiting, like, I looked at my watch like a shitload, it's like at about the half hour mark I looked, then about the 45 minute mark I looked, and I was like, at one of these marks, we're going to hit a stride, is what I kept thinking. That's why I kept looking, because it was like, it's going to, you know, do this, and maybe this is just all this intro, We've all these characters we've been introduced to, we're all going to have, you know, it's all going to come to a point at some point. Obviously we know one point that's going to be, is him getting arrested, but... 
Um, like, there's one scene that's really crucial that just kind of hits you like a gut punch. Um, but it it doesn't really have a lasting impact. Um, and there's not really anything like that ever again. <laughs> um, so, overall, and it's like, I just saw this. It's been at least a few hours because I saw The Predator second. Uh, I saw this first, so it's like... I'm doing my best to get this out as fast as I can because as I'm speaking to you right now, I can just feel a fog descending on my memory of this movie already. Um, it's like I'm going to forget most of the stuff in this movie by probably the end of the weekend. Um, it's just going to... It's just going to go right in and out because there's really nothing particular... Even, even the performances sort of just... You feel like there should be something memorable left here. Even by McConaughey... Um, and McConaughey does have, like, a monologue here or there, or his last scene in particular is pretty good, but overall, it still feels like it, there's just something really missing here. Um, and it just feels like this sort of bland line, just kind of from beginning to end, and it goes in those directions, but it never finds anything in any of these places it wants to go. Um, it all just feels very flat, no matter what direction it's going. So... Yeah, and then, of course, when it gets to the point uh, when we do reach the end and the inevitable happens, um, it, it's so rushed. It is so incredibly rushed and so sort of, like, last minute. Um, but, yeah, so I just I just really couldn't get into it is the main issue. Like, every time I felt like I was kind of on the verge of it, I would it would just sort of kind of lose me again, and I, was just, I would just kind of start... I wouldn't even... It would be hardly sometimes I'd be even taking it in. I just, after a while, felt like I was just staring blankly at it. And I didn't, and just nothing, just nothing was sticking with me. So, that's that's really unfortunate, because that has a lot of potential. Um, I suppose, if anything, it may need a documentary, uh, if nothing else. So, um, maybe, at some point, this story will be told in like a really big, memorable way. But, uh, I, I really don't think this is going to be it. Um, so, I don't know. But, yeah. Um, so let's end on, uh, The Land of Steady Habits, Netflix's new movie that came out this morning, um, which I was actually, obviously Netflix, I, you know, scoff at 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, that last video I did just about broke my spirit entirely. I almost stopped doing this, not just Netflix, I almost stopped doing this entirely. <laughs> but, um, maybe some people want that, but whatever. Uh, so... But I actually had a bit of excitement for this because it was a Nicole Hallsinger movie starring Ben Mendelsohn. And if you don't remember her name, she did, like, uh, Friends with Money with Jennifer Aniston, uh, Please Give with Rebecca Hall and Amanda Pate, Enough Said with Jan uh, Joy Louis-Dreyfus and James Gandolfini, um, and smaller ones in, like, her early career, like Lovely and Amazing, which had, like, Catherine Keener, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Walking and Talking, which had Catherine Keener and Leah Schreiber. Um, all those movies are worth seeing. Like, every single one of them. Like, n none of them are, like, you know, masterpieces, but they're all very good and very worth checking out. And her style, where she has this very... This whole thing about the realism and the relatability and all that stuff, uh, that whole thing that is so popular in the indie scene, she has, like, her own voice. I guess you could say... She, you, she's comparable, probably, to Lynn Shelton a little bit, but her, her movies are a lot more... I find more warmth in her movies than I do Sheldon's movies, um, and that and that goes a long way. And you can definitely get a sense of her. This one's based on a novel, but you still absolutely from beginning to end do get a sense of her. Um, just like the fact that um, Ben Mendelsohn is our leader. U usually she has more. Um, she usually focuses more on um, female leads, but here um, Mendelsohn's pretty much front and center from beginning to end. Um, which is great, which is a great place for Ben Mendelsohn to be. Um, and he's this dude who is basically said fuck you to life in general. Because uh, he was, like, leading this really high life in one of those, not like a gated community, but basically in that particular sort of circle. Um, and he basically just got really tired of it. He he quit his job. He goes around telling people he retired early, but um, he basically quit his job. <laughs> And he just goes around, um, and, he, and he left his wife behind, Edie Falco, because, obviously, you know, the director wants to work with both Sopranos, so... Um, so now Edie Falco's happened, and everybody's sort of going in their different directions, and Mendelssohn is still... 
even though it probably seemed like he was gonna, you know, quit that life and go on to something much more freeing, um, he's still pretty much stuck while everybody else is moving on. Um, and that's pretty much where we are when we meet him. Um, he still goes around, and despite his sort of, sort of like his life now being like the absolute makings of a loser <laughs> incoming, um, he still has like this charm about him where he like, he has this surprising ability to get laid, like on a whim. Like, he can go out and he can say, like, two charming things to a woman at just some store, at Bed Bath & Beyond, and then the scene cuts and they're in bed together. And this happens, like, three times. <laughs> so he's still got some charm in him that basically is what he's able to ride um, throughout his life to keep him basically from being completely left in the dirt, to keep that, to keep that ego of his sort of going in some way or another. Um, so... But eventually we do realize that um, even though he, he does slow, seem to slowly come to terms a little bit with maybe this isn't the life he thought it was going to be, but at the same time we're also getting the other side where it's, um, where everybody that's leading, you know, this, you know, big seemingly glamorous life is also, like, uh, really depressed and, like, there's their kids are going to rehab and all that. Um, so we see the life that he believes he's escaping. So even if he's not quite in that territory, he's still going to find himself in a territory. <laughs> um, good or bad, but with this character, most likely, bad things just seem, sort of seem to be like a magnet for him, mainly with the sort of passive way he approaches life itself. Uh, so we know in one way or another it may catch back up to him, but the question is, is if he's going to even care or not. And that might sound like it would be a hard character to s stick with. Uh, like, you can see him as, like, totally unlikable, um, and unsympathetic and all that, but that's sort of the genius of what Mendelssohn accomplishes here. Because it's, like, while it is a bit of a mystery of how he's able to, like, bed women so easily despite his attitude, um, it still doesn't, it's not entirely baffling. We still kind of, get, when we see his, not just that either, men, many aspects of the movie, Looking at his character, we do sort of, like, get it. And that's a really has a lot to do with the way Mendelssohn plays it. Like, the way he's... Even though he's escaped this world, he still, like, goes to their parties. He still associates with them. Even though he claims to hate most of those people, he'll still just kind of hang around them anyway. Um, and somehow, some way, watching Mendelssohn's performance sort of makes this still make sense. It's probably one of my favorite performances of the year right now. Um, and... It's the way that he doesn't really... He could have very easily, but he doesn't play him as unlikable. He basically... Like, it's, it's to the point where we see this guy, and he's... We should hate just about everything about him. But it's like, watching Mendelssohn, it's like, we can sort of kind of see where... Not necessarily we can see where he's coming from, but where he probably thinks he's coming from. <laughs> um, if that makes any sense. Um... And he just kind of goes uh, from through scene to scene, and in one way or another it all kind of works, especially in that way where um, the way she directs the scenes to him is able to, in her casting process, bring this together, like um, Josh Price, who pops up in a lot of movies, particularly these indie movies, I think in a couple of Lynn Shelton movies even. Um, it's like when you see him and Ben Mendelsohn just sitting at a bar together, and that's how the scene starts. We don't even know who this character is yet. Obviously, he's just some random friend, but it's like... You just can't... This scene can pretty much do no wrong. They can talk about anything at this point. Um, and she, as the writer and director, will make it work, and they, as the actors, will make it work. Um, and the two of them, together, being those actors, just in general, having that... That something about them that you just want to keep watching, and that's that's what a lot of the scenes feel like. Um, where it's like it doesn't really matter where the scene goes, you just really like watching the characters in general, whether they're likable or not, whether they make shitty decisions or not. There's still something that's just constantly drawing you to them, or at least me anyway. Um, and when they introduce the younger characters too, like Thomas Mann and his friend, um, who once again seem like they can be a bit off-putting and a bit like sort of like the young characters you would expect, they act that way, how Thomas Mann can't seem to grow up, how he's still living at home and going to rehab, despite the fact that he's 27. But there's also the other guy, where he does seem like he'd be a bit more like, like just this sort of way he looks at the world, and it's a bit, like, precocious to what would be an annoying degree. Um, still, somehow, he's an entertaining character that I ended up liking anyway. 
um, especially the interactions between him and Mendelssohn. So all of that kind of works too. And the way there are these little details, like, I mean, you can look at details like visually all around, but there's also these details in the dialogue, which can be hilarious. Um, where like the way when, um, when Mendelssohn just kind of shows up to talk to Edie Falco when he's like not welcome. And when he walks in, her greeting is just okay. And then that comes up again. Mendelssohn says it uh, to, I think, Bill Camp later. And it's like you get a sense that one of them sort of picked that up from the other. Uh, and it's sort of funny when you hear another character say it the same way. And then later, Bill Camp gets his own chance to say it. And then you realize they must be picking this up from her. And it's this continuous thing through every. It's somehow every character is going to adopt this delivery of one word eventually. And there's just something sort of really funny about that. And also, um, the way. Um, the uh, Thomas Mann's friend is talking about how it annoys him when his dad says the word irregardless, and he's like, is that even a word? And he just, like, it's just something that really irritates him. And then in a much later scene, when his dad says the word irregardless in conversation, it's like nobody draws attention to it, nobody points out that he said it, and he doesn't, like, pause or anything, he just says it within a sentence, and it just goes by... And when you remember that scene, just him saying that one word, it doesn't matter what the rest of that sentence was. Um, it's just really funny the way they work that back in. Um, and yeah, it does have, you know, some, you know, spots that could be picked up a little bit. There's one one character that could have been a lot more flushed out, and that's the, uh, flushed out, that's the Connie Ridden character. That's sort of like... We basically learn pretty quickly is basically his only chance of finding normality again with another person, or at least the closest thing to normality this guy can get. Um, and it does, when you look at uh, the director's other movies, and you see that this is like her first movie without Catherine Keener, and your immediate first thought is, Catherine Keener in this Connie Britton role probably, even if as thin as it is now, I feel like she probably could have brought something to it. Nothing against Connie Britton or anything, but Catherine Keener really has this way of making a lot out of a little uh, that probably would have served a lot better here. It really makes me wonder how she didn't end up in this movie, because it seems like sort of the perfect lineup. But, um, yeah, so, but all that stuff aside, um, it does work very nicely. Um, the, the, I don't know how I feel about, you know, the last five or ten minutes or so. Um, but there, there is one unspoken joke with a cashier and Mendelssohn that had me laughing audibly even though I maybe shouldn't have been, um, but but it still worked for me. So, uh, but yeah, and you have those sort of, you know, every now and then a character may seem a bit not flushed out enough, but overall, um, I actually like this quite a bit, especially for a Netflix movie, but as I said, with the talent involved, um, I don't think that was going to play for him. This, this still very much feels like one of her movies, and right, right in with that lineup that she has, so... Uh, that's what we have for this week. Um, obviously, there's going to be a versus coming and more review videos and all that stuff. Like, um, The House with a Clock and Its Walls is next week, and hopefully maybe a simple favor and maybe a couple of other things. Uh, and so on, you know, all that stuff. And then the October stuff is coming with all the horror verses and all that. Uh, getting two a week again, like last year. So, all that stuff. So, until all that, uh, 